warm and welcome everyone to our session about Agile HR today. We're starting this meetup in a very strange times of the world. And I just want to say welcome to this session. We are hoping that we can uh, focus on learning about agility and Agile HR today, while we are also understanding the suffering and the horrible things going on in Ukraine currently. I think that this is the time when we in HR can be very, very creative and agile. Uh, while living as a neighbor of, uh, of Russia ourselves or myself in Finland, I feel a lot of different emotions and all those emotions that you might have are also okay. Um, what I would like to say as a HR leader is that we can carry a very, very big um, responsibility about this. We sit on jobs, we sit on job ads, we are looking at uh, job profiles, etc. While being myself a granddaughter of refugees from the Second World War, I know what it means with new beginnings. So if we in this call can take a, take a while and think about what can we do to give somebody a new beginning, that would be awesome. Um, and, and with these words, I want to leave um, the, the crisis outside of what we're going to talk today. But I hope that you can start thinking about that yourself. What can we do to give people new beginnings? With those words, uh, let's uh, welcome you all to the Agile HR Communities Meetup. We have, host these meetups once a month, maybe, around themes which are about Agile HR. And today we got a very, very exciting meetup coming up with Netflix. Um, we're going to learn about Agile HR in a very, very tech-oriented, very fast-moving, fast-growing organization. Uh, a couple of words about Agile HR first, so you know who we are if you are new to us. So Agile HR community was started about four years ago uh, with the aim of getting people in HR or development, management development up to speed with agility. There wasn't really anything on the market that spoke the language that we spoke and we were trained and experienced in Agile. So we thought, okay, let's set up um, this ourselves. And we are very happy to have you here and we're happy about being able to teach agility to the non-IT professionals of the world globally. We've got trainers, events, um, speakers, and meetups, uh, what we do. And we also um, recommend the book Agile HR, which I was co-authoring um, uh, 2020, not the best year to give out a book, but that is something where you can start if you want to start learning about Agile HR. Now that said, we are, are super thrilled to welcome our guests, um, or our guest and our second co-host, so uh, warmly welcome Jenny Lee Deal from Netflix. We've been working with uh, together a bit um, during the last year, and we are so thrilled that you can be here sharing what you have learned about agility. And we have Kate Rand, who is our lead trainer and associate in England as well. So I'm going to give, give you some time to introduce yourselves and your companies. Um, but uh, um, without further ado, yeah, let's start with Jenny Lee. So hi, Jenny Lee, and welcome. Hi there. So thank you so much, Arena and Kate, for having me. I'm so excited and honored just to be able to be a part of this community and talk about agility. Uh, also, Rena, thank you for you know, making space at the beginning of the session, and I echo your sentiment about what's happening um, in Ukraine right now. Uh, to briefly introduce myself, so I'm Jenny Lee Deal. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm located in Los Angeles. I've spent my whole career in HR. Uh, right out of school, I knew I wanted to tinker with organizations for really the rest of my professional career. And for the past four years, I've been able to do that at Netflix. Uh, so Netflix you know, is, is a tech and entertainment company. We are probably more an entertainment company today, but definitely really strong culture and roots in tech. Uh, we're at about 10,000 employees globally, um, which really mirrors how we are expanding globally in terms of uh, serving our members and really having a, a, a growing member base. I am in the talent organization. So we use the word talent versus people or, or HR that kind of um, you know, explains all of the fields within HR. And I've spent most of my tenure in the HR space, although more recently, as Rena mentioned, I have taken on a talent strategy role. 
which I'll explain more later. And also I am leading our global learning and organizational development team, uh, which has just been an incredible place um, to really practice Agile, which I can't wait to talk about more. Awesome, thank you very much, Jen Lee. Happy to have you here. And it's, it's super exciting because you, you've got, so you had a couple of different roles uh, during the time when you've looked into agility. So it's key, we're keen to hear your insights. Kate, lovely to have you on board as well. So Kate Rand, our super amazing trainer from the UK, our associate there. Kate, would you introduce yourself and what you do? Yes, excellent, thank you very much. So I think I've met quite a few of you already through the programmes. Uh, so I'm a trainer for the Agile HR community um, and have been for the last three years. I'm also the chief people officer uh, at a company called Thread Styling, which uh, is a, a fashion tech business. So it's a great sandbox to experiment with because it is a scale up. Uh, things have to happen incredibly quickly whether uh, from responding uh, from responding to world events uh, to also being able to scale the business. Uh, and it's a great crossroads between tech and that more traditional retail. So we have teams from logistics to technology to luxury private shoppers. Uh, so it's a really awesome environment to practice agile ways of working and figure out how to put all of those users and personas into the center of what we're doing. Uh, so I specialize in startup and scale up stage businesses. Uh, I'm also an organizational psychology practitioner um, and really embed that into everything that I do. So yeah, happy to be here. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And a short introduction about myself. My name is Rina Hellström. I'm the founder of Agile HR Community. I've been tinkering with Agile for 12 years and in HR for ages. I'm not going to even mention how long. Um, I've been using Agility um, for almost anything from the most um, administrative and um, what, what you find as a com compliance related thing to the most um, innovative culture strategy all of those things so all in between so if somebody says agility can't be used somewhere um i'd like them to have a word with me because i think that it can be used almost everywhere with those words let's get on with it so we've got a couple of themes that we're going to talk about today i'd love to first hear a little bit around the context so agile hr and agile wherever you use agility is very very contextual you can't take a model or a framework or, or a, um, a, a set of blue, a blueprint and start implementing that into your organization. You have to be very contextual. So let's first dive into the context a little bit, uh, the context of Netflix and the context of, of thread styling, what we're gonna hear examples from today. Can you share a bit generally of where is the company Netflix currently regarding kind of, if, if you're thinking about adopting agility, can you, can you describe that a little bit for us so we understand the context? Yes, definitely. So it was in 20, you know, a couple of years ago that when I looked at your book and I had one of those light bulb moments and I know we're not here, right, to, you know, to give you tons of compliments, Rena, but I have to say I was reading this book, Agile HR, and I had just gotten into the, this new strategy role and was looking at the learning and organizational development role. And I felt like I, in some ways, was reading about Netflix. And so there were a bunch of light bulbs that, that, that went off because I was partnering as an HR BP with the engineering teams. And I started to realize, oh my gosh, you know, the way that we experiment, the way that we really try to understand the problem uh, and the way that we are in this constant cycle of really listening, experimenting was, was very resonant of, of you know, the way that we have built our product. Um, I, I did not see that happening as much in our talent organization or not in the way that that your book was describing, right, of all of the ways that you can really unlock that mindset. Uh, so I felt like while there was a great foundation to bring agile practices in a bigger way to talent, that there was still an opportunity to kind of push, I mean, definitely push the learning and organizational development team, but also just push the talent organization into um, more more agility. Um, I think I think what we found is that it very quickly clicked. The language is there. The thinking is there because your organization is thinking this way already. 
Very, very cool to hear that. Kate, what about you? You work in a super techie organization as well. And you've got a very um, demanding clients, if I understood that correctly. So you have to be very customer focused and oriented. What about your, your, your context? Yes, we have very demanding clients and I have very demanding shoppers that service those clients. Um, so I too have very demanding clients. Uh, th there's a few things that we have seen over the past year and actually um, speaking to other uh, organisations that have sort of started up during the pandemic, um, it seems to be a bit of a theme. So we've had a lot of um, pushback from people around personalisation when it comes to their experience within the organisation. And this idea that, you know, you should really be curating their package, their benefits package, their experience, their learning, and it should be around them, which is a fantastic idea. But when it comes to the reality of it, it can actually be quite challenging to figure out how you do that for an individual. Um, but this theme of personalization is there. And actually, the, the more we, uh, we've dig, dug into it, the more we see that inclusion comes through choice. So if you can nail personalization or the choice options, um, certainly the younger generations, because our business is, is mainly, mainly Gen Z, uh, will really thank you for that. The, the other piece that sort of goes with that with Gen Z is the, the feedback culture. So I, I don't really have oh, to- Oh yeah, push... they are. They are keen for getting feedback, right? Yes, yeah, I really don't have to push very hard to get feedback. Uh, and what we've seen over the last year and a half is this gradual increase in engagement in any kind of uh, survey that's asked for them, focus groups, things like that. They are so much more willing to participate and share their yeah. very strong opinions, um, which is great because you you know up front what you're designing and co-creating for. Awesome. And the final, the final one actually is that because so many of these uh, companies have kind of shut up during the pandemic to bring sort of solutions to problems that maybe weren't quite so mainstream before, there's some really good tech solutions out there for people teams, which are very low cost, easy to, to put in place. Um, there's one I'll put on the chat actually, which we're using, which is called Progression App, which is the answer to transparent career pathways and transparent um, salaries, if you want to go as far as putting those up. And there's this whole trend out there of these low effort, high impact um, sort of crowdsourcing type models where you can just get things up. And a lot of tech businesses are really kind of catching on to them and they just speak the Gen Z language. Oh, cool. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that, um, that example. Let's move into our themes. So first of all, um, we, we just want to hear about some insights about starting with agility. Um, when, when we discussed with, with Jen Lee, we, we realized that when you work, or also with Kate, when you work in a very, very fast moving um, techie organization where people are willing to give feedback, where people are, have opinions and you realize that they're, they're more customer-like and you, you really design for their needs to help them do a fantastic job in their work. What, what kind of insights would you have? How is it agile helping you and how is it probably is it conflicting with something are there some trouble or some uh, some challenges using agility as well I'd love to start um uh, on opening the question with with Jenna Lee so when, when you started with kind of agile with a big a really starting to work with these practices methods the language the technique what did you find what kind of insights did you find when you started with this it's, it's great. Just thinking back to when we started. Um, so, so there were a few things that were pretty natural for us. Uh, and, you know, and then a few things that we had to learn into. So what, what felt pretty natural was starting off with really examining the business challenge as, as you know, a key way of kicking off your journey. And, and this was both from a talent strategy perspective, as well as from um, when when, when we were doing global learning and organizational development strategy, we were really at the foundation. So we had a lot of what you might call, you know, blue sky room to work within, but that meant that we had a lot of discussion on how do we think about the business challenges. So that, that felt pretty natural for Netflix because we do spend a lot of time on, on that kind of thinking or, you know, first principles thinking. It was just Agile brought a framework for, for us, you know, in order to be able to do that from a talent perspective. 
So that was great. You know, we fell, we fell right into it. Um, and then also, as you know, Kate was talking about with uh, feedback, we have a really direct, candid feedback culture. It's super strong. It, we, we cherish it a lot. We work on nurturing direct feedback behaviors a lot. So again, there was sort of this you know, mindset and behaviors that were already there, but we just had to channel feedback into a way that kind of worked for the agile process, whether that was through user testing or setting up different, you know, listening mechanisms. And, and I'll talk more about that. So, so that was complimentary as well. And um, if, if you all take a look at Netflix's tech blog, there are some really good pieces on there about experimentation um, from a product perspective. And so we're big on experimentation. We love our A-B tests. You can read all about it in terms of, you know, how we do that internally. So again, it was, you know, shifting that to the talent space, I think took a little bit more work of, okay, how do you actually A-B something, you know, in the talent world, do you even have to A-B? Uh, but, but there was a pretty good foundation, you know, in terms of um, just trying to make that switch over. Let me just jump on to, to tell the yeah. audience what A-B testing means. It means that you might create two different alternatives and test which works better. I've even seen HR do A, B, C, E tests to five different alternatives, put them in front of people or try, try five different alternatives out with new um, employees and see which one gets best feedback. So this is what we're talking about. Really prototyping, testing something in reality to get feedback. So not just go on your gut feeling. Yeah, just wanted to kind of throw that in here. Yes, yes. So it's really bringing up the rigor and and either fully, you know, implementing two different versions or bringing it to prototype. So so those are all the things, uh, Rena, that seemed to work pretty well. Um, you know, as as we got into it, though, some of some of the challenges that we just had to work through, and I have to say, I was, you know, probably, you know, I felt some of the similar things that hey, are we moving fast enough? Um, because we have a pretty strong bias to action in the company. And so you're, you know, you're constantly, you know, trying to make sure that you're doing highly effective and highly efficient work. It's just part of our culture. And for those of you who may have gone through, you know, some of the agile steps, they can feel honestly a little tedious in the beginning. And I, you know, I made a comment in the chat that Kate, Kate is, incredible because we actually brought brought in Kate um, to walk us through the steps and I had a little bit of this impatience you know gosh do we need to spend all this time on the business challenge um, do we need to now now we have to get into empathizing and categorizing and Kate would really say well what's the moment that matters pick this one piece and and we're spending all this time and then you're kind of waiting to say well let's get to the work and I could feel that from my colleagues as well now that was short lived though, because after you do it a few times, you realize that you're ending up with just a much, much better prototype or product. Um, but it took some trust, honestly, to, to be able to um, uh, you know, retrain your brain that this is part of the important work, even if you're not getting right into brainstorming or, or, or ideas. So that's been a learning and it continues to be a learning when we're in cross-functional groups that maybe aren't like don't have as much experience with this kind of method. And so you really have to help to set expectations um, and that continues to be a work in progress. And um, so that was sort of one, one, one piece. And then the other challenge was, I think from just an HR subculture perspective, you're, you know, we, we certainly weren't used to showing half finished work or to show, you know, a really early prototype. It has, has to be perfect, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you don't really have to do that as HR. You kind of have this, or you used to have more of this, you know, gosh, you can roll out a program or a process. And I think now that the employee experience is rightfully becoming, you know, more of a focus, I think it's starting to shift the way we work, but it definitely, um, you know, our, our, that kind of perfectionist piece that you mentioned that we felt that initially um, when starting our listening with employees so early. So that's something we had to work through. Amazing. Let's hear some, some thoughts from Kay. What about your, your environment and challenges and, and using agility there and, and maybe comment, commenting on or what, what you learned from working there with Netflix a bit as well? 
Yes, um, I think the point you made about bias for action, I was I was smiling when you were saying that because I do remember going through going through those sessions, but it, it's so common um, whenever I run the programs and we're going through all those different steps. I always say to people, you know, this is, we have to do so many steps before you get onto the work as you think. And these steps are really important, whether it be to go through a design sprint or if you're going off to go and do product development, you know, that there is a lot of preparation that goes into being able to do something correctly. Um, and actually one of the, the hacks that I use in, in with my team, because they're the same, you know, they, they just want to run very, very quickly, is I say to them, you know, well, can you just write down what the problem is that you're trying to solve? Just, you know, just to remind them, get them back into that moment to say, we've got the double diamond, you know how design thinking works. Let's think about solving the right problem before we design the right solution. And that we have just have that line where it's like, well, just, just write your one sentence. What is the problem you're trying to solve before you run off? And I think, you know, certainly from Thread's perspective, they're very creative people, you know, Netflix, incredibly talented, smart, high performing. They just just want to use all that energy um, and come up with that solution really quickly. So it it is something that you have to train yourself and you can get very easily carried away with this idea that you're, you know, the momentum's there, you're going to run off and you're going to go and solve it because being in a scale up is about being quick and being quick means that you don't go and ask for feedback or you don't think about what the problem is. You just go off and react really quickly, but actually it's, it's counterproductive to do that. Awesome. I think one thing that I've sometimes heard is that there's nothing worse than being really good at doing something that you shouldn't do in the first place. So, you know, delivering the wrong thing efficiently is not what we want to do. So just figuring out what we're there to solve first and then really focusing on delivering a, an amazing result um, leading to that result or that goal. Thank you. What about the, um, the premises of, of succeeding with, with agility? Because there is um, kind of capability bill that needs to be there. You can't just say, now let's be agile and let's start using some tools and tricks and, and Kanban boards. You need some capability build and you need kind of to get into that mindset and understand how the thinking differs from what you did before. You kind of started started touching upon that a bit. Uh, Jen Lee, would you, would you mind sharing a little bit about that mindset part? Yes, definitely. And, and I see a couple notes in the chat too about mindset. Um, well, I, we, we did take the approach at Netflix of making sure that we had a core group of, of us who were really investing hours and hours and hours in training and reading and even, you know, getting a coach like Kate so that we really worked on our own mindset shift. Um, most intensely, knowing that we were going to have to work with others, you know, in order to build. And we are increasingly, you know, cross-functional just in the way that we operate um, and just the way business works. But we wanted to make sure that we were really investing in our own capability. And for, for, for us, one of the other like aha moments is really trusting that the employees are at the center of everything that we do. And I know that you, you know, reading that is easy and sort of, and it kind of feels good to go, yeah, the employees are at the center, you know, especially from, from an HR perspective. But as we know, HR was not, you know, historically brought up that way in the industry. HR was for HR. We were there for the company. We were allowed to be a little bit maybe lazy many, many years ago, you know, in terms of how we delivered things. So, so, um, making sure that we were always keeping the employees at the center was definitely a mindset shift. Uh, and it was something that we knew we were going to invest in as all as our small ish group of, you know, agile kind of agile champions. And we were going to make sure that when anything we designed or any business problem we approached that we were just going to keep those principles, even when we were working with a cross functional group. Awesome. That customer centricity is so important. And as you say, it's very easy to say that out loud. Yes, of course, we're thinking about the employees. But do you really, if you are looking at your solution from an employee perspective, um, have you been looking at how they would be using that? Is that useful for them? Is that valuable for them? Is it um, the user experience and user interfaces, etc.? Kate, you work a lot with 
design thinking and um, and the mindset as well with your teams. And can you share some reflections there? So, uh, <laughs> so many things to share with it. I so I run design sprints with my own team in Threads. I also run it with the executive team. And then if we need to kind of do a hack day or something like that, we've done one most recently on fine jewelry. Um, and how we can up the sales on that, it, we'll then go and run the same method. And I would say the the seven steps that we have within the Agile HR community are great. Um, you can pay a lot of money to go and learn about design thinking, you know, but it doesn't need to be overly complicated. There are seven very basic steps. You just need to constantly go through them and you need to make sure that you trust in the process and do not skip a step. Do not be tempted to skip a step. That is probably my biggest piece of advice because regularly with my team, when they go through it, you know, they'll sort of jump around a bit and I'm saying, no, you just got to follow it through. Just go through all the steps. It'll be a better result. Yeah, we're many people are keen of jumping into the solution and they want to they have all those fantastic ideas that they want to lay out on the table and start working on those because that's where our brain naturally go naturally goes to as well. Brilliant. Something that I've learned um, with that, some, sometimes people ask me, but we can't deliver everything that everybody else wants. You know, we get a lot of requests. A lot of employees have opinions. And this isn't about doing what everybody wants. This is about understanding and listening the needs, the requirements, what the real people are doing in their real jobs and how we can, in the best possible way, serve them. Sometimes it might mean that we need to create two different alternatives of doing performance management discussions or, or doing feedback um, feedback rounds or something. Sometimes it means that we are going to have two different tools or we realize that we don't have a possibility to have these options that we really need to do just one size fits all, but at least we can try to formulate that in the best possible way. It doesn't mean that we do everything to everyone. I just wanted to clarify that as well because we have constraints we have limitations. We've got capability, um, capacity limitations of our HR team as well. So uh, understanding that there is always a balance, but it doesn't mean that we don't want to know what the real requirements are and how our products would be used up front with some prototyping and testing. Any comments on that generally with um, understanding where kind of the limits of, of our creativity and innovation and, and delivery lie? Yes. Yes. I wanted to kind of underline your point that I, I do think that in the beginning, when we were really trying to make sure that our customers, our employees are at the center, it did, there was a little bit of fear that you're almost giving everything over, you know, to employees to basically decide, right, what, what the product is going to be or the process or the program. And I just want to underline your point that if, if you're first going through some of these initial steps to really understand the problem you're solving for and you're putting various framing or what you might call, you know, constraints, then you're really getting to a point where you are co-creating with employees on the thing that you're trying to solve that you believe is driving business value. So once, once we got to that point from a mindset perspective, I think we were, um, you know, we, we were really invested, but I do think, you know, I'm watching the chat that the change management of this can sometimes feel difficult. And maybe, you know, maybe you're experiencing that at your company, but there was something around, well, does putting employees at the center mean that you're giving kind of the whole strategy to them? And I don't think that's the case. I think it's the opposite. You're bringing them into your strategy and kind of making it stronger um, so that you get a sense of their lens. Awesome. I, I agree with that. I agree a lot with what you're saying is that when you, I mean, if we start from the, from the idea and the mindset that we trust our people to be smart, they are smart, they're willing to do a good job, they want to create an, an amazing uh, workplace where things and processes and practices are working for them. That's, that's where we start from. And then when we co-create with them, if, if we tell a smart person that we have 500 euros to do something, they won't come with ideas that cost a million because they understand there's a constraint. Or if you say that we've got this uh, nice thing like employment law in this country that we can't break, but within that frame, we can do quite a lot of innovation. So let's keep in mind that we've got this law 
but what could, what can we do when we have this law so that's what we're talking about being creative with people with the same constraints and this is what we see quite a lot with especially these techy young very innovative companies is that they've got the same law as any traditional organization in the same country but they do things so differently than these traditional organizations and i i think it's sometimes a very easy out and very easy reason not to do something just to say no you know what uh we've got this a uh, law or we got the regulation or we got the policy or whatever also a question this is sometimes what I say to people. Question, is, is it really a, a legal thing or is it a policy or is it a belief? Because if it's a belief, you can change that. If it's a policy, a little trickier, but you can even change that as well. If it's law, uh, it's it's a longer journey to start changing that. But just, uh, just thinking about these kind of things as well. We can start pushing the limits of these beliefs and policies. Awesome. Okay. We've got, um, I thought about the user testing and um, um, what, what about, any, anything more about that when you test with employees, something that you would like to give as a tip or what you found that works or didn't work that well? Generally, would you go first, anything that you think about that user testing and listening to stakeholders really? Yes, yes. So. So user testing or listening, you know, is really the foundation, right, of, of Agile, of setting up your ways of making sure that you are co-creating with employees. So what, you know, what I would say worked well and was, was relatively easy was figuring out how we were going to set up focus groups and get people to um, get people to engage on our prototypes and give us feedback or to set up you know, little surveys or different mechanisms for being able to listen. So that worked well because the group, remember this core group had, had gone through the training, we knew exactly why we were doing it, and we were so eager to, to partner with our employees. Uh, and our employees also love to give feedback. And so all of that worked. Um, what, what, was, what we had to learn through was at first, I think because we were so excited about listening and setting up, um, you know, and setting up all these mechanisms, I think we spoke a little bit too much about that with our stakeholders, which mean, you know, which basically means we were focused too much on the process of agile versus on the narrative of the value we were delivering. So I definitely felt that a little bit. Um, you know, in our first projects, like we were, you know, really looking at actually a feedback product. We were, we were revamping and I realized I was sort of losing my stakeholders sometimes and in, in particular, my executive stakeholders. And I don't, and, and I realized that they don't really want to hear, you know, about all the different ways that we're listening and the detail that I was so, so interested in. And, but they really, you know, really um, caught on when I started to talk about, well, what is the value or the business uh, challenge or the problem that we were solving for? So all that work really really resonated with stakeholders and i learned pretty quickly that um, maybe we keep all of like the agile love right all, like all of that sort of we kept within the group in terms of how we were operating um i, I love how you're saying so, you know sometimes agile isn't the end goal right agile is an approach it's an approach to get things done in a changing world uh, where things, uh, requirements um, are changing, where you need to be able to really co-create. And sometimes I tell the teams who start with this, if you're in a traditional organization, this will seem very odd on how, odd on how you're working. I think that it wasn't that odd in Netflix, but if you're in a traditional organization, you start suddenly working this way. Don't make a big deal out of the way you're working, uh, is my, my recommendation. Don't start talking about, we're now agile and we're doing this this way. Just, just get, the, get it done and deliver the amazing value and show it through results that, hey, we, we created this product or this people service and everybody loves it. And we you know, had help from 50 people in the organization. When you start then after that talking about, okay, we actually did that in an agile way with, you know, with a cross-functional team and did this and this and this, people start getting interested. What about Kate, what are your thoughts about this um, kind of uh, approach and, and having 
you know, not using always the terminology and not making a big fuss out of it. Yes, and I've got some thoughts on the user testing bit as well, um, yeah. which I'll, I'll comment on in a minute. So, uh, yeah, I, I fully agree. I think, you know, I, I work with execs. Execs don't like noise. They just like results. They don't care how you got there. They just they want to be reassured that what you're doing is going to work. So if they put their name to it, it's going to be credible. So you just keep everything else to one side, show them the result. And if they like it, then you can explain that it's it's linked to this agile way of working and isn't that great, which is why now in Threads we run design sprints for pretty much everything because they saw a great outcome of it for the flexible working. So now it's become the coolest thing we can do. So it's, it's just used for everything. Um, and so on the user testing one, um, a couple of points which I think might be quite helpful for people on the call. If you're doing user testing, you need to treat your user testing group selection like you would an experiment. And what I mean by that is don't just use the people in your ecosystem. You know, if you don't ask your HR team to be the, the testers for you because they have a lot more context into what you're delivering uh, rather than a fresh pair of eyes. So treat it as you would picking your sample selection for your experiment and make sure you actually get a cross section across the business. Um, and then another couple of points on experiments, because this is where HR people can fall down a bit. Well, you know, they do the user testing, they get the prototype, they say it's worked. If you if you you need to understand what a true experiment is, and when you're creating a hypothesis, you need to understand how you can actually prove or disprove that hypothesis. So quite often with HR teams or with execs, to be fair, when they're trying to prove to me that something is a, a worthwhile cost, they will just provide you with a bunch of data without understanding which variables are supposed to impact others. So if you're going to experiment with something or you're going to test something, be very clear what the dependent and independent variables are and separate them out and take the 10 minutes to do that before you, you jump in. Because if you can't prove it was worthwhile, you could end up investing and being wrong. And that's the opposite of Agile. <laughs> We're supposed to only deliver value and make sure that we really are evidence-based in what we do. So spend some time becoming comfortable with setting up proper experiments. Yeah, and sometimes the, I think that one thing that HR people are not very keen to do is fail or learn through, okay, finding out this didn't work, you know, we need to take a couple of steps back and just rethink this whole thing. They think it's a failure or at, overall in business, uh, we, we kind of label that as a failure. I would say that's learning. And um, my, my recommendation for people who want to start with this mindset is that's the point that really challenges if you're agile or not. When something goes wrong is how you deal with that situation. Are you taking it as a learning? Are you starting to look into, you know, what were our, our assumptions? Why did we make this choice? Or did we find out early enough so we didn't invest too much in a bad idea, um, too much time and effort in, into a bad idea, but really got them killed early on? So killing bad ideas early on is a really good thing. There's a, there's a very successful gaming company in Finland called Supercell. And I love their culture of anytime a game fails. I mean, they put hours and hours and hours, thousands of, of dollars into game development. Anytime a game fails, they have champagne for the whole company because they know that when it failed and they stopped it, they are not wasting more effort, time, thousands of dollars into continuing with something which would fail in the anyway in the end. So I think that's also something that we need to remember. Learning early, getting that feedback early on is super important. Let's uh, move into um, any, any other comments on that one before we move on by just opening up for Jenny and Kate. Anything that came to your mind uh, from this discussion? No, other than I love the champagne story. And, and I do think that, you know, taking risks and failing is definitely a big, a big part of this. And so I feel lucky that, you know, Netflix does have a culture of taking risks. And I can understand that, you know, if, if your company doesn't have that subculture, uh, then maybe, you know, you're leaning more into what you mentioned first, which is you're creating kind of your inner team subculture, you know, where you're, where you're making it safe. Um, but it's definitely a big part of Agile and it can be hard to let go of all of your great ideas. Uh, but the, you know, the prize of knowing that you're really driving that, like the greatest business value is definitely worth it. 
Yeah, and I can also see what you mentioned there. One, one idea that came to me is that you kind of, when, when you start working in an agile way in, in a team, you move from having that individual space and that uh, responsibility of individual tasks and that kind of connecting to your own professional ego somehow, you move away from that and you start working on a platform together. You've got common goals. Everybody are sharing. Everybody knows what everybody else are doing. You agree that in a stepwise way. So um, when you learn, it's not, not kind of hitting you personally either. Usually it's usually a common thing that we learn and quickly iterate around. Yes, let's move forward. Uh, the second theme that we wanted to kind of talk about is, is um, in talent. So when, when Netflix is growing, you're growing with a massive pace. You've got 10,000 people and you are now moving towards being an international entertainment company, um, have been very US based before. So um, the, the conversation about how is this, these, this mindset and how are these agile principles helping you to grow internationally and grow the talent? Um, that's an important theme, I think. And many people, when they have talked about this meetup in the social media, they said, yes, I want to learn how this is used in talent. Uh, so that's an important theme for many here. Definitely. So, so as Rena mentioned, I mean, we, we are truly a global company, both from our employee base, as well as our members and future members. And what that means for learning and organizational development is, is pretty significant. Uh, so we are a wonderfully diverse workforce. We're, we're becoming more diverse, and that's just in all these different lenses. That's in geography, right? That's even in the kind of roles that we have. So we have varying levels of seniority. Um, we used to be, you know, a, a company that was more, you know, for, we, we would say fully formed adults. So you really kind of knew, knew your role. And now we have all different levels of seniority. We are, we have a blend of tech and entertainment. So we have macro industries. And then of course we have um, the macro cultures of, of the offices. And so how do you balance the macro culture of that country with Netflix's unique culture? So when you look at all of this and we're trying to figure out how do we, like, what do we need to build? What is a global product? What is truly a global need? And what might actually be more of a local need and a local product that you build? Uh, we, we, we really didn't know how to do this other than to embrace Agile, meaning we had to really start to um, think about personas. So that's the word that we use, but what are, different, what, what are the various personas and employee needs that we see all across the globe? And we really had to think about how do we set up our listening mechanism so that they're truly global. And from a learning and organizational development perspective, Many of our folks have been in the U.S. or are located in the U.S. We're growing outside now, but we were so or we are so conscious that we're very likely bringing a U.S. lens to the way that we are building. And so we had to ask ourselves that like that was its own kind of you know constraint is how do we make sure that we're not building U.S. you know only needs right into our global products. And the only way we were able to do that, or we are able to do that, um, is, is through using Agile practices. So I'm happy to kind of go more into um, some of the you know, problems that we face, or the, or the challenges, I should say. But we applied this uh, to some of our learning needs. So our learning suite, for example, something like uh, management fundamentals. We used Agile to ask ourselves, okay, we think we know that there are foundational skills that every single person across the company needs to know, but how do we, um, how, like, how do, we do, do things like set up our hypothesis? How do, we, how do we use data and employee listening to really make sure that we are um, truly seeing a common need across the company? And what we have come out with, interestingly enough, is Whereas management fundamentals might be a global need that actually looks different um, depending on certain, certain functions, depending on certain countries. So 
we actually are a global team that is building a suite of management fundamental solutions that are really built for specific audiences. And so it's kind of a cluster of products versus just one. And I have so many examples that, um, you know, that I can continue with, but, but these were the ways that we started to think about um, serving our, our, our global employees. I love that. And that also brings, brings up the need to modularize. If, if we think about products overall, not just people products, but modularizing, having modules that people can choose from according to what is their need. Having some kind, instead of one size fits all, you think about having a cafeteria platter where you can choose some things according to certain constraints, what works in your organization or your country. So I think this is also the thinking that spreads now quite a lot in HR. And what really limits that is our, our practically our capacity, I think, and our budget. Because, um, but then there are outsourced companies who can offer, I think, help in this as well. So very, very interesting. Uh, I, I like how you said it looks different depending on units. Can I just ask you a question? Because I, I kind of got that question. When you work with management fundamentals, sometimes we might think, okay, let's ask the managers what they need. But did you also ask the employees what kind of, what leadership means for them? What great management means for them? Are you yes. muted? Yeah. No. Yes. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a great point. Um, and I also want to respond to something else you mentioned. But yeah, so, so I think understanding, well, it's really employees, managers, and then you know, we use the term executive. So, yeah. so maybe the managers of managers uh, and HR. <laughs> so, so I think getting, getting multiple perspectives on something like management, because I feel, you know, it's kind of the joke that there's millions of books about management or leadership and everyone kind of has their own view. Uh, so, so we made sure to ask a few different audiences uh, when, it, when it came to what are the fundamentals um, and, and, and I want to tie that to something you mentioned on, you know, sometimes the constraint is budget and time. And, and I think that that's true. And um, one of the things I'd like to just propose, you know, because there's never enough time, right? Like all of us are kind of overloaded and there's always budget constraints. And, you know, especially I think when it comes to talent, there's a lot of pressure of like, how do you know that, that this is going to deliver value? Right. Um, so what I would propose is that by by do by doubling down in your investment and in listening, I think that you become more influential when you are going to propose, you know, what the product is and propose the budget behind that product, because you have a lot of backup data to say, hey, well, you know, these are all the things we could do, but given, you know, we have to pick one or two, this, th these are the areas, let's say, you know, the management fundamental modules. These are the areas that we know are really going to drive the most impact in our business. Um, and so we've, we've at least had some luck, you know, here at Netflix in terms of using, the listening as a way of really being influential when it comes to resources. That's such a great point, generally, because what we say is that you should do quite a lot of this listening and what we call discovery before you actually create that project plan, get that budget sorted, get the team up and, and running, is you, you need to know what, you're, what problem you're solving. And sometimes when you do this properly, what I've seen is that we can even get the business paying for things. We don't need to have that budget in the HR budget because when we, we've calculated what the benefit will be, create a business case out of it and say, hey, you know what? If we uh, invest 100K in this, we can see that over two years time, we're going to get 2 million euros of savings in time or effort or whatever. And it's a business case that they can understand rather than saying, oh, we will in improve this and this and this, but we don't have a calculation of what it costs really to deliver that. So I think with this listening, we can also be more clear on what we're building, what are the constraints and how are we going to get there, what it costs as well. Kate, any comments on this one before we take a couple of questions and, and start start looking up? My comments are more around the modular side of things, which I then yeah. started to message back to Ian on the chat. Um, so I can I can pick up that unless you want to close this bill. Please, first. please. Um, so the the modular piece fits in very much with that personalization. And we um, at Threads have built a modular uh, leadership program 
which covers multiple tracks. And that's because we have different people with different experiences in the business. Uh, so we have what's called the next gen track. We have a superstars track and we have a leaders of threads track, but they are all made up of a, a variation of, of um, modules that we have built, which we tested out last year. We did a version of, we run it in a sprint format. Um, to Ian's point, you know, how do you not end up with just <laughs> hundreds or millions of um, sort of products that you're putting out there because you're trying to assess the needs? Well, for us, it was about using uh, some uh, like a version of analysis, thematic analysis on all of the user needs that you're collecting, because there is only so much learning that's going to be different. Like humans are human at the end of the day. So it's about making sure that the products that you build, obviously you iterate on them and you make sure that you've got your clear learning objectives, success metrics up front. And you just make sure that after every session, you're getting that feedback and you're iterating on it because there will be a point where you have a core set that support the business success and the employee success. And by making them modular and you know putting them on demand as much as possible, you're freeing up your team's time and you are making it personalized. I think I think here we 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 are getting a lot of uh, different questions about how can we calculate the business case and interesting practical examples of listening mechanisms that you found that you worked. So so we're kind of getting into deeper into design thinking, which I don't think we need to kind of start diving into. I think there is so much great great material about this out there that if you want to and of course from agile HR community, if I may be a bit commercial, <laughs> we also. Uh, of course, deliver trainings and, and events around this. Um, uh, there, there are a couple of questions that I would like to can get to, which I picked up from the chat. Um, this one, how have you coached business partners to build up an appetite for learning, pivoting, reprioritizing people initiatives without risking sponsorship? So that I think that's quite a, quite a good because we've got people partners in the businesses. They might not be in the development teams. They might not be in there. How do we bring them along so that they are partnering with us and seeing the results quickly, rather than just seeing all this experimenting, you know, trying out to co-create, etc. There's a point where we need to deliver something as well. So what are your thoughts generally with this people partners and business partners, stakeholders? Yeah, de yeah, definitely. So I I do look at people partners as definitely, you know, an, an, a core audience that we're making sure we're listening to. And I feel, you know, we talked about what kind of listening do you do before you even start to build? And I find that that talking with stakeholders and making sure that you're spending spending the time is critical to influencing later on. And I know it takes time. And I do think, you know, we, we get a little bit, we're ready to get to the work itself. Like going back to, you know, we believe that just the ideating and brainstorming and creating the product is the work, but knowing who your stakeholders are going to be and whose support that you need up front and engaging them again, not on, you know, not talking about all of the agile process, but engaging them on, for example, when you have your, your uh, problem statement or when you have your, you know, what you think is the moment that matters that you really want to spend time improving on. For me, I would, I would go to, you know, I would try to see if I could find a, a C-level or a couple C-level uh, people that I know would have an interest in this and, and, and really try to get their insight of how much do they think this matters, right? I'm hearing it's a moment that matters. What do you think about it? And really trying to make sure that I'm engaging in that um, prior to even building. Yeah, what about Kate? Thank you very much. Kate, what are your thoughts? Um, I think I, I agree with what Jen Lee's saying on it. Um, the, I put my, some comments in the chat earlier on to answer it. I, I think if you if you're in a position where there is a risk that that sponsorship will go, it means that you haven't listened to the needs of your user. So when you are working with that HR BP, you are moving them to become an agile HR coach. And part of that is about helping them understand how to get buy-in and how to articulate value. And as Jen Lee says, how to listen, because they are this awesome link between 
you know, the HR team and the rest of the business. And they have so much insight and knowledge that if they listen well and they communicate well, they are the best advocates and champions of anything you're putting together. That, that's that's really important. And they are also the link to the business leaders who are practically paying for the people services um, um, in each budget. I think one thing that we also need to touch upon is the hippo because uh, the hippo means the highest, I'm just writing that in chat, the highest paid person's opinion. Because when you, when you work with Agile and when you've done what we talked about today, you've done that prototyping, testing, finding out, listening, getting data and evidence of what works, what doesn't, you can go into conversations with a really different mindset and really different confidence when you work with what we call hippos. Because everybody has an opinion about people operations. Everyone has an opinion about management and organizational development and behavior and how we should do things. But if you go into those conversations with saying, hey, we surveyed 50 people. Out of those, we tested these through two, two approaches. This one got this much better feedback. It really works with these the, in, in the factory factories, but doesn't work in the commercial. We need to find another solution there. You, got, you go into those conversations with data and evidence, and that's my recommendation. So you're much more prepared for, for doing the right thing practically. Now we are at one minute before, so we are starting to wrap up. Let's wrap up with um, one tip that we haven't mentioned today. Jenny Lee, would you have a tip that you would like to recommend to everybody who wants to learn about Agile HR and start using that in their people operations, talent, culture teams? I mean, the most obvious one would be, I, I really think the, the book was the most impactful um, thing for me personally and for the team. It gave us a common language. That'd be number one tip. And then I think number two is just jumping in. You don't have a lot to lose here, right? I like to say it's just work and jumping in with a few agents of change who have a similar mindset with something small um, is sort of how we started to, we, we, we built our way up to some of the bigger things I'm, I'm mentioning. That's grand because you don't need to start with everything at once. You can start smaller. Kate, a tip. You might have have a thousand of them but maybe one which is important today uh yes i'm going to give two very quickly one is always <laughs> ask questions if if you are about to do something you haven't asked someone for their feedback turn around to the person next to you and just at least ask one person because you it will become better from you asking someone else their thoughts and the second one is however big you you want to deliver something that piece of value break it down further always break it down further the, the value can always become much smaller, much quicker, much easier, and still as valuable. So always break it down. That's it. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much for that ending. I want to thank everybody on the behalf of Agile HR community. Thank you, Jenny Lee, for sharing your insights and learnings with Agile HR at Netflix. We hope that you have a fantastic journey towards internationalization, towards growing the company and towards growing that talent. And uh, thank you everyone for being joining with us. We will send you some follow-up emails with a discount code, of course, um, for some of our sessions. So uh, thank you very much and stay safe, stay happy, uh, love each other. Uh, make sure to, to be with your loved ones um, as much as you can. Thank you everyone and, and see you around. Bye.